video 13. Uh, this is Mr. Azapardi with another video about Buddhism. This one's uh, about Buddhism in the West. And the question is, is Buddhism misrepresented in the West? So what we're really talking about here is whether people in the Western world, um, by which we mean, as we've talked about before, we mean kind of Western Europe, North America, and then Australia, New Zealand, those countries, do they have a distorted image of what Buddhism is like? Is their idea of what Buddhism is like a distortion of the the original teachings of the Buddha? That That's the sort of questions we're looking at. So, you know, if we were in the lesson, I would start by this. What kind of image does Buddhism have in the West? How do people think about Buddhism? So, you know, we're, we're in the Western world here. We could begin by thinking, how do people think about Buddhism in this country? You know, what strikes me as about it is that people have a positive view of the religion. Not When I teach Buddhism for the first time, I often get students saying to me that they don't know anything about Buddhism, but if they were religious, they would be a Buddhist. Well, there's something odd going on there, right? Because they don't know anything about the religion, yet they have a positive view of it, especially when compared to the religions, in the more traditional religion of this country, Christianity. There's often seen the idea that it's a better religion somehow amongst people who are disillusioned, perhaps, with Christianity than Christianity. So that's an interesting thing in itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, a little bit about why we might think Buddhism is distorted. Westerners have a distorted view of Buddhism. We're going to look at six ways in which pe in which we might say that yes westerners do have a distorted view of buddhism and then we're going to look at ways we might challenge the idea that westerners have a distorted view of buddhism so first few first part of the lesson i just want you to have the slides there with you if you can print them out that's great you might want to add some notes as i go through them so first thing, Buddhism enjoys a positive reputation in the West, even in countries like those of Western Europe, in which interest in religion is generally declining. So that's an interesting thing, right? In Western Europe in particular, interest in religion is, and you know church attendance, stuff like that is going down. And yet, at the same time, Buddhism enjoys a positive reputation. Often, it enjoys a positive reputation because it's not seen as quite like other religions. So, you know, often you have this idea that Buddhism is a philosophy and not a religion. How do you find, how do you really you know use evidence to show that Buddhism is pop, has a good reputation? Well, it's very difficult actually to find firm evidence. One thing I found was this: a study of newspaper articles about religion in Denmark found that of all the newspaper articles that mentioned Buddhism, only fourteen percent of those about Buddhism contained any negative ideas about the religion. So the rest were very positive or neutral. For Islam. The figure was 33%. So you see there's a lot more negative stories about Islam than about Buddhism in the newspapers. That's just that's just one piece of evidence, but it maybe is significant. Now, what, look, when looking at how Buddhism is represented in the West, we can look at a number of different sources. First, we could look like that thing does at the media. TV, radio, newspapers, websites, magazines, films, adverts, and so on. How is Buddhism portrayed in those things? Secondly, we could look at Western Buddhist organisations. So, you know, how do... Buddhists who practice Buddhism in the West, how do they portray Buddhism in their teachings, books, websites, and so on? Thirdly, we could talk about famous Buddhist teachers from the East who are popular in the West, such as Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama. We're going to look in particular at the Dalai Lama in, a, in another lesson, in a future lesson. But uh, for now, we could just say, well, we could look at when they talk to Westerners about Buddhism, do they, how do they talk about Buddhism? Do they talk about it in exactly the same way as they do when they're talking to Buddhists in Asia? Or do they talk about Buddhism in slightly different ways when they're in the West? That's quite an interesting question. With all of those things in mind, taken as a whole, what we can say as well as being positive represented, positively represented, Buddhism tends to be represented in the West in particular ways. We're not going to go into depth into like how do I how do we know that Buddhism is represented in ways. We're just taking it as a fact that Buddhism is represented in these ways. And I would say number one place you'd find these is among Western Buddhist organisations. So these six really represent how do Western Buddhist organisations often portray Buddhism. So how is it portrayed? Well, number one, it's often seen as a non-dogmatic religion which accept which accepts and is supported by modern science one of the reasons why it's seen as perhaps not as a religion sometimes. Secondly, it's seen as a religion in which men and women are treated equally. Thirdly, it's seen as a religion which places importance on helping those in need. That's linked to the topic of engaged Buddhism. Four, it's seen as a religion which teaches we should care for the environment. Again, linked to 
engage Buddhism. Five, it is seen as a religion which does not stress the difference between monks and lay people. So almost like monks and lay people should do the same things. Six, it is seen as one religion with the difference between different schools being relatively unimportant. So we're going to go through these one at a time. I'll go through them fairly quickly, but if there's a, there might be one or two places where you want to, might want to add some notes. Oh, we've got another slide before we do that. So we're looking at um, yeah, the information that I've taken. This largely comes from this an article by someone called Jay Garfield, a scholar. Now, he refers to the form of Buddhism, um, um, which emphasizes those six qualities as what he calls Buddhist modernism. Now, the term Buddhist modernism was first used by someone called Heinz Beckett in the 1960s, and he used it to refer to new ways of looking at Buddhism which emerged from the 19th century onwards. This new, new way of looking at Buddhism differed sometimes radically from traditional Buddhism in many ways. So, you know, it's a kind of modernised version of Buddhism. Therefore, it can be argued that since the way in which people understand Buddhism in the West is shaped by Buddhist modernism, Westerners do have a distorted understanding of Buddhism. So, that, so from that point of view, we'd say if Buddhist modernism is a distortion of Buddhism, and if that is the form of Buddhism that has become most popular in the West, then maybe Westerners do have a somewhat distorted understanding of Buddhism. Let's look at the six things in order. So number one, Buddhism and science. While Christianity tends to be seen as a dogmatic religion, which is in conflict with science, Buddhism enjoys a reputation in the West as a religion which is in line with science. Now, do by dogmatic, what we mean is a religion of fixed beliefs. So a dogma in Roman Catholic teaching, that's where the word comes from. A dogma is a, 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 a belief, a teaching that you must agree with. So the idea is that while Christianity tells you you must believe in this set of things, and if it conflicts with science, you shouldn't believe it. Buddhism has a reputation as a religion which is non-dogmatic, which doesn't say you have to believe in a fixed set of things, and which is therefore in line with scientific teachings. Now, wh whether that's actually true of Christianity, I just want we don't. It doesn't matter at the moment. We just want to stick to um, the. Is it true of Buddhism that it's non-dogmatic? Now, newspapers often report scientific findings about the benefits of meditation. So that's one way in which people think, oh, meditation is like a scientific thing. In addition, teachers such as the Dalai Lama promote the view that Buddhism is a religion that is willing to change its beliefs based on scientific evidence. You've got a quote here from the Dalai Lama. If science proves some belief of Buddhism wrong, then Buddhism will have to change. The Australian Theravada monk Arjun Brahmavamsa has said that while other religions, quote, bend the facts to fit the faith, Buddhism says we should bend the faith to fit the facts. In other words, if the facts that come out from science contradict the teachings of Buddhism, he says that in Buddhism you should change the beliefs of Buddhism rather than ignoring the science. Whereas he says other religions, because they're dogmatic, say, oh, we should change, we should like only accept those facts uh, if they fit in with what the teaching already believes. However, why is this? could this be seen as a distortion? Well, traditionally, Buddhism has emphasised the importance of many teachings which are not supported by scientific evidence. Karma, rebirth, the existence of different realms of rebirth, the power of paritta, the supernatural powers that you can get from meditation, and so on and so on and so on. So, you know, that... that Although I, I don't know if this could be it's a complete distortion, it does seem to be a difference. Is it a religion which accepts many, many supernatural things that can't be proved? Or is it purely a religion of science and when, where there's no faith needed in the supernatural? That seems to be a difference in the way Westerners understand Buddhism to the traditional understanding of Buddhism. Next one. Uh, Buddhism and women, the positive image that Buddhism enjoys in the West often leads people to assume that Buddhism teaches equality between men and women. This idea is supported by the fact that many Western organisations, an example would be the Samatha Trust. Samatha Trust is a Theravada meditation centred uh, group. So they basically teach Theravada Buddhism in the West, which teaches complete equality between the sexes. There's no monks or nuns in the Samatha Trust. Um, it's purely a lay organisation and, and Therefore, there are no differences in terms of the roles that men and women have in the in the organisation. The idea that Buddhism is a feminist religion is also supported by quotes from Buddhist teachings like the Dalai Lama. Here we have a quote from the Dalai Lama. I call myself a feminist. Isn't that what you call someone who fights for women's rights? However, 
while the Buddha seems to have taught that both men and women are able to reach enlightenment, we know uh, from what we've seen before that from the earliest times, Buddhism has never treated men and women equally. Nuns have always had a lower status than monks, and in some parts of the Buddhist world, the order of nuns has died out completely. So there's no nuns in some parts of the Buddhist world, while there are monks. So, yes, it's often enjoyed this reputation as a feminist religion, when really, historically, it doesn't, doesn't deserve that image from what we've seen. Three, socially engaged Buddhism. In the West, Buddhism is seen as a religion which is concerned with helping those in need and fighting for social justice. The term socially engaged Buddhism was first used by Thich Nhat Hanh in 1963 to pr promote the idea that Buddhists should be socially aware and active. Organisations founded by Western Buddhists such as the Buddhist Peace Fellowship and the Karana Trust work to fight poverty and bring peace in different parts of the world. However, Christopher King, we looked at him, we looked at engaged Buddhism, in his book Engaged Buddhism, argues that engaged Buddhism is a new development within the Buddhist tradition. He argues that traditionally Buddhism has been concerned with personal spiritual development and not with changing society or helping others in a material way. So Buddhism originally was about uh, enlightenment and it only is it's a distorted in the West because it becomes about uh, fighting social justice. You know, we could bring into this, remember what Richard Gombrich is right from the very beginnings of studying about Buddhism. Remember Richard Gombrich when he talked about Varna, he said, well, the, the Buddha said that Varna is irrelevant for enlightenment, but the Buddha didn't care about getting rid of caste, the, uh, the Varna system. He didn't want to get rid of the Varna system. He accepted it as part of society. He just saw it as ir um, uh, irrelevant for um, getting to enlightenment. So yes, the concern that's here, that's found in Western Buddhism with uh, making a difference in the world doesn't seem to be there in the original Buddhist teachings. Four, Buddhism and the environment. Buddhism is seen in the West as a religion which teaches respect for the environment. The Dalai Lama stresses the importance of environmental ethics when he teaches Western audiences, and his website has a whole section dedicated to the topic. So if you go into the Dalai Lama's website, just type in Dalai Lama, you'll find there's a whole section about environmental ethics. Thich Nhat Hanh, very popular in the West, also stresses the importance of environmental ethics. Western-based environmental organizations such as the One Earth Sangha help to raise awareness about environmental ethics among Buddhists. However, Jay Garfield argues that this concern with the natural world is a new development which is not found in traditional Buddhism. And we've kind of seen a bit of that in, um, in our lesson about the environment, that at least the Buddhist attitude towards the environment seems at best to be slightly ambiguous. It doesn't seem to be that that was one of the big concerns of the Buddha to protect the environment. Number five, lay people and monks. In the West, Buddhism tends to be seen as a religion in which the distinction between lay people and monks is not very important. This can be seen most clearly when it comes to meditation. Westerners see meditation as the most central practice for all Buddhists, whether they are monks or lay people. This lack of a distinction between monks and lay people is seen most clearly in organisations like the Samatha Trust, in which there are no monks. However, even in organisations which that have monks, like the Forest Sangha, so the Forest Sangha is the other biggest um, um, Theravada tradition you find in the Western world, and it's very different from the Samatha Trust in the sense that there are monks, and they're very strict monks who follow the rules very strictly. They are the monks that we saw. So when we watched that video about nuns and the situation of women who want to be nuns, we saw, you know, the Forest Sangha was that group who were refusing to allow women to become fully ordained nuns, and then Arjan Brahm, he was one of the Forest Sangha, and he was one who, who went against their rules by ordaining uh, nuns. So even in organisations that have monks, like the Forest Sangha, there is an, the expect, there is an expectation within the organisation that lay people will be interested in meditation and follow the Eightfold Path. So even where it looks like, if you went to a Forest Sangha um, monastery, you'd think, oh, there is a big distinction between monks and lay people in that you know, you've got one set of people in robes following the rules with a shaved head and one set of people who aren't. But... You know, scholars who studied that form of Buddhism say, well, yeah, in one way that's true, but in another way, the traditional idea, in another way, it's still thought that both of these people should be following the Eightfold Path and trying to get to enlightenment and do a meditation. So this is in contrast with traditional Buddhist attitude, which often assumed that meditation and trying to reach nirvana was something that only monks do. Lay people were expected and said to make merit and try to achieve a good rebirth in their next life. So... There's something of the distinction between Kamatic and Nibbanic Buddhism, but it's often said that in you know early Buddhism, um, or maybe in just the whole of Buddhism before the modern period, that most lay people were not 
thought to be trying to get to Nirvana. Nirvana was for monks, and not even for all monks, only for some monks. So there would be quite a big distinction between monks trying to get to Nirvana and lay people not trying to get to Nirvana. And that's obviously that. So then with that, that distinction not being there in Western Buddhism would seem to many to be a distortion. Last one, Buddhism is a single, a single religion. So within Western Buddhism, we find a tendency to see all forms of Buddhism as ultimately the same and often to combine different forms of Buddhism together. Sangharakshita, who's the founder of the Triratna Buddhist community, he is an English guy. His real name, well, his birth name was Dennis Lingwood, he, and he became a, a, a Theravada monk in India. And then he and eventually he came back to this country and set up it, his organization. They were they were they were quite famous. They used to be called the FWBO, the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order, but they've recently changed their name to the Tri Ratna Buddhist Community. Now he has trained with Theravada, Tibetan Mahayana, and Zen traditions, and he combines all three in his teachings. And that's typical of Western Buddhism: the idea that you can combine different forms of Buddhism. Tricycle, which is a very uh, famous, long-running Buddhist magazine in the USA, is dedicated to all forms of Buddhism, not a single school. So you can see, look, you've got at the top, that's a Zen monk at the top. You've got the Dalai Lama, Tibetan Mahayana, and you've got uh, some Theravada monks there at the bottom. This shows the degree to which Buddhism in the West is seen as, see themselves as part of a single community. So that's interesting. Now, this is a magazine not for Theravada Buddhists or Mahayana or whatever, but for all Buddhists. When I say all Buddhists, amongst Westerners who practice Buddhism, by far, the, you know, there are certain that, um, that kinds of Buddhism that are the most common to practice, and they would be Zen from Japan, Theravada, and then Tibetan Mahayana Buddhism. So those are the three that often get combined. This is in contrast to Buddhism in the East, where the differences in teachings and practices between schools often make it difficult for them to see each other as truly Buddhist. This is seen most clearly in the fact that Mahayana Buddhists traditionally refer to Theravada Buddhist, uh, Buddhism as Hinayana, the small or lesser way. This name clearly indicates that Theravada is less valuable than Mahayana and less truly Buddhist. So, you know, traditionally the idea has been that, you know, people would have thought our form of Buddhism is correct and their form of Buddhism is wrong. It's in the Western world, though, it almost becomes seen as that they're all saying the same thing, just in different ways. That kind of idea comes through. Okay, so, so far, <clears throat> what we have is that all the information seems to confirm the idea that Buddhism has been misrepresented in the West. However, there are a number of ways we can respond to this point. So we're going to look at some of the responses, and then we've got a task with another resource that we're going to do at the end to kind of look at those responses a bit more deeply. The first response, is this one is a bit, a bit less of a response in some ways, because this response is not to deny, doesn't deny that Buddhism has been changed in the West. It just kind of asks us to look at how it's been changed in a different context. So Jay Garfield says that, he's the guy that wrote this article, he points out that Buddhism has always changed when it moves to a new culture, and that these changes have been particularly significant when Buddhism has been introduced to places which already have an advanced culture with a significant traditional tradition of philosophical thought. For example, if we look at the history of Buddhism, some of the most significant changes in Buddhism took place when it travelled to China. And, that, and when we say when it travelled to China, a lot of the... A lot of the forms of Buddhism we see in Japan are really an extension of changes that already happened in China because the Japanese Buddhism comes to Japan through China. So if you think about Zen and Pure Land, which we find in Japan and have their origins in Chinese Buddhism, you can see these are two of the most radically different forms of Buddhism. And, and Jay Garfield says, well, that is not surprising because when, in, when it came to some countries, Buddhism would have been uh, bringing... Uh, the its culture to those countries to cultures without a very at that time a very advanced culture or very advanced philosophical culture when it came to china china already had a very long well established and and deep philosophical culture and what jay garfield has said is you can't expect a religion to come into a culture like china which already had a very um embedded and complex and in and uh, well thought out way of looking at the world and just remain unchanged it's bound to be changed when it comes into contact with this complicated culture and that's what happened in china so what he's saying is yes buddhism has been um transformed in the west but i guess the way he's saying it is this we don't need to see those things as distortions ways in which buddhism has kind of 
Western Buddhists have gone against real Buddhism, but as necessary adaptations. The fact that in order to survive in the West or in order to make sense to Western people, it has to adapt to the culture in which it finds itself. Otherwise, it will make no sense to people in that culture. So that's one way of, of, of addressing the idea that it's a distortion. Secondly, J. Carfield also points out it's, that it's not as simple as Buddhism becoming distorted in the West. In reality, many of the changes in how Buddhism is seen uh, that are happening in the West are happening in Asia as well as in the West. So Buddhist modernism, remember we said that the, the form of Buddhism we found in the West has been referred to as Buddhist modernism, is not an exclusively Western phenomenon. Since the 19th century, so 1800s, in a Buddhists in Asia have been influenced by Western thought, and this has led to changes in how many people in Asia think about Buddhism too. Therefore, the ideas about Buddhism found in the West are not simply a distortion of a real Buddhism found in the East. It's not just like everyone in Asia is practicing one form of Buddhism and then everyone in the West is practicing another. They are based in part on the fact that Buddhism in the East has itself been significantly transformed by contact with the West. A number of examples can illustrate this point. So here's some examples to illustrate that point. Garfield says that Western environment, the Western environmentalist movement has influenced Buddhists in Asia, such as Thich Nhat Hanh, to become focused on environmental ethics. So the idea here is that, yes, um, the interest in, in environmentalism in Buddhism is a new thing uh, and not part of traditional teachings. And that has come from Western influence, but that influence has influenced Buddhists in Asia and in the West. So... If Buddhism is becoming distorted, it's not becoming distorted in the West, it's become distorted in both places. Secondly, this goes back to what we saw in engaged Buddhism. Christopher Queen argues that socially engaged Buddhism emerged because of the influence of Protestant Christianity, which emphasises the importance of social action on Buddhist countries like Sri Lanka. This led to criticism of, uh, of Buddhists, Buddhist, Buddhist social passivity and calls for Buddhists to do more to help society. So... The idea was that where does the where does the emphasis on on Buddhism going out and helping society come from? Well, Christopher Queen thinks it originally comes from the fact that countries like Sri Lanka, which were colonized, colonized, sorry, got the word wrong there, that were colonized by by the West, by the British in this case. The idea that religion should be should emphasise social action was found amongst Protestants in England. It then went over to Sri Lanka during colonialism and people looked at Buddhists and said, oh, these Buddhists are just meditating and trying to get enlightenment. So that's not what they should be doing. They should be out there helping people. Buddhists are too socially passive. They need to do more to help society. And that caused Buddhism to become interested in social engagement more in places like Sri Lanka, in the East. So again, we can see that the change, if there is a change, has not just happened in the West, it's happened in the East as well. See, Richard Gombrich argues that Protestantism, which emphasises the equality of all Christians, both lay people and priests, also influenced Buddhists in Asia to play down the distinction between monks and lay people. So a big thing about Protestantism compared to Catholicism in Christianity is that in Catholicism, there's quite a big divide between the priests and um, your normal lay people, people who are not priests. Uh, in Protestantism, so in Catholicism, that's a big deal. In Protestantism, the idea is that there are no priests. Yes, you have people who run churches and stuff, but there is supposed to be no real difference between any followers of Christianity, according to Protestantism. We're all on, they're all equal. The idea, again, Richard Gombrich says that in places, again, we're talking about places like Sri Lanka during colonialism, that attitude that there's something wrong with having a division between monks or priests and lay people influenced Buddhists in Asia. And so Buddhists in Asia can, can start to think, why should people, why should lay people not do the same things as monks? In Sri Lanka, there was a very famous teacher called Anagarika Dharmapala, became very influential in Buddhism uh, during the colonial period. Uh, he became a very famous teacher and very famous preacher without becoming a monk. And he encouraged lay people to practice meditation. So he kind of was part of this movement to say, we don't really need to have a distinction between lay people and monks. Lay people can meditate just the same as monks can. So again, the idea there is that, look, that, that blurring of the lines between lay people and monks that's happening in Western Buddhism was actually happening in Asia uh, before Buddhism came to the West, or at the same time, maybe, as Buddhism spread to the West. It wasn't just 
a change that was happening in the Western world. The third thing should to say is that it should be noted that although the six points discussed above, so that's the six ways in which Western Buddhists might uh, misrepresent or misunderstand or distort Buddhism that we've looked at, um, although they all they both represent, although they all represent significant differences to the traditional understanding of Buddhism, in most cases we can find aspects of Buddhist teachings which support this way of thinking about Buddhism. So from this point of view, the Western understanding of Buddhism is less a distortion and more a tendency to focus on certain teachings rather than others. So this is where we're going to do our next task. The idea here is that all the things that we've looked at, the idea that Buddhism is non-dogmatic, the idea that Buddhism preaches equality between the sexes, the idea that Buddhism uh, is concerned with the environment, the idea that Buddhism is um, uh, believes in social action, the idea that there's no difference between monks and lay people, all those things, even though they're not quite true of Buddhist in Asia, even though we can see them as ways in which B Buddhism in the West have um, differed from traditional Buddhism in Asia, that none of them are complete distortions. None of them are just completely opposite of what Buddhism teaches. They're, the roots of those ideas are found in Buddhist teaching. So this is where I want you to open your other document. And what I, all I want you to do is read these teachings. So the, the eight, this is the Word document that I've sent you. That's got how many teachings? One, two, three, four, five, six. I just want you to think, what can you link this, these teachings, uh, to any of the those six distortions or, uh, or six un ways of understanding Buddhism that we found in the West, um, which of these teachings suggest uh, uh, can be linked to those those uh, six teachings? If that makes sense. So those six uh, ways of understanding Buddhism. Uh, you'll get the idea. Read the reading and see if you can see how it's linked to the, to, to the things we've talked about. Then pause the video and I'll just go through it when you when you have a go at doing it, looking at it. OK, you should have looked at your reading. Uh, uh, I'm going to go through each one. So the first one says Richard Gombrich suggests that the Buddha did not think that lay people could reach Nirvana. However, there are many cases in the Pali Canon of lay people becoming very skilled in meditation and reaching the higher stages of the path to Nirvana, such as the stage of non-returner. So um, this to me suggests like the first bit, Richard Gombrich says that the Buddha said lay people can't reach Nirvana. But that, that's not what the Pali Canon says. The Pali Canon says that Lay people could be very skilled in, in meditation and could reach the higher stages uh, of the path to nirvana. So, um, yeah, the idea that lay people and monks should have completely different paths and that one should be just making merit and one should be going to nirvana is not found in the Pali Canon. So we can say, actually, maybe Buddhi lay Buddhi uh, Western Buddhists are not distorting Buddhism when they say uh, monks and lay people should, do, should not be different to each other. In the Pali Canon, the Buddha says that women can reach Nirvana, and it is recorded that over 500 of his female followers had reached Nirvana. So, uh, yes, there is some things in the Pali Canon which suggest that men and women are, are equal in Buddhism. Metta, loving kindness and compassion, kar uh, karana, are essential elements of the path to Nirvana for all forms of Buddhism. Well, this would be my link to social action. This would be the idea that, well, OK, maybe Buddhism wasn't all about um, uh, going and changing society, but... Buddhism is all about metta and karana. They are really important things. And you can see, easily see how focusing on those things could lead you to help want to change society. Kalama Sutta. Um, in the Kalama Sutta, of course, the Buddha says, don't believe in things just because they're in holy books or just because a famous teacher has said them. So this could be linked to Buddhism and science. But the Buddha here says, you know, uh, don't take everything. Uh, don't, don't believe in things just dogmatically. Don't accept them just because they're in the scriptures. Now, we know that the traditional Buddhist understanding of that sutta would have been that actually when you put them in practice, you'll find out they are true. But you can see how it could be used to to influence Buddhists to say, well, actually, Buddhism says you can uh, you don't have to believe everything that's in his teachings. You can find that um, if you find things in science that go against his teachings, the Buddha would not tell you to to uh, you'd have to stick with his teachings in that situation. The Buddha refused to teach the Dharma to a hungry man until the man had been fed. This again goes to social action. It suggests that there is some some times when Buddhists would say, look, if people are suffering, we need to go out there and help that person with their suffering in a practical way, rather than just telling them to get to enlightenment. 
There is evidence in the Pali Canon that some of some early Buddhist nuns were highly regarded and influential teachers. Again, it suggests that gender equality was a big thing in in well, or gender equality is part of the Buddhist tradition to some extent. So we can see that all of those, well, most of those ways, there's only one of those is not really addressed there, and that is the idea that, that um, there's only one form of Buddhism. But all of the others, even though they can be seen as in some ways uh, going against uh, traditional Buddhism. In other words, they can be seen as continuations of parts of early Buddhism that were already there. So it's not as simple as saying, oh, all these aspects of uh, Western Buddhism are distortions. No, they're perhaps more, it's perhaps better to say they are tendencies to emphasize certain parts of Buddhism rather than others. You know, so if we take the case of gender, you they're emphasizing the parts that stress equality and then de-emphasizing the other parts which are not so don't treat women in such an equal way okay